We're following new developments in the search for answers about the origins of the COVID-19 pandemic. A new report from Senate Republicans concludes a preponderance of evidence supporting the theory that the outbreak started from an accidental lab leak. The report alleges that researchers at the Wuhan Institute of Virology collected at least 20,000 animal virus samples and were testing them subpar biosafety environments. But the investigation also concedes it's possible that the virus could have transferred from animal to human at Wuhan's seafood market. Senior national correspondent Terry Moran sat down for an exclusive interview with the Republican senator behind the report, and he now joins me. Terry, thank you so much for joining us, first of all, but also what stands out from this report, and can you break, us, break it down for us? How significant is it? Sure, Mona. This is another uh, look at the evidence. And the evidence includes, this is a very thorough survey of the evidence that's scientific evidence, the virology itself, the epidemiology, and the circumstantial evidence. Clues, things like a mysterious spike in flu-like illnesses in Wuhan months before uh, China acknowledged that there was a novel virus circulating there, and all kinds of things like that. It was put together uh, by the Republican leadership of the Senate Health Committee, uh, and it is, as I say, a very thorough report. I sat down with uh, Senator Roger Marshall, Republican of Kansas. He kind of honchoed this. Uh, he's a doctor an obstetrician. He took a kind of personal interest in this. He pushed the science on it. And, and they have come to some tentative uh, and even startling conclusions. Take a look. Well, let me break this down a little bit. The report does talk about the preponderance of evidence. Now, in the law, that's, that's a pretty low level of confidence, yeah? How would, how would you describe your own feeling? You know, I, I think number one is that the, the facts are solid in this investigation, that they followed the scientific method. They laid out two theories. One, that this was a zoonotic spillover from, from nature. And number two theory is it came from, from a lab. And they said, let's do everything we can to shoot down both of those theories. And, and they've done that. It shows a preponderance of evidence that this came from an unintentional laboratory leak. I, I think anyone that's a reasonable person will look through this and come to the same conclusion. What does it tell you that they filed for certain patents, what, in, in November, October of 2019? The patents that they were releasing in November 2019, December 2019, had to do with biocontainment, that there was some type of a leak going on. So there's multiple documents that would show all through 2019 showing the concerns about the leaks that were going on, the laboratory accidents, and how they were trying to fix them. And this all crescendos kind of to a head in that September, October 2019 timeframe. Do the patents for the biosafety indicate that they're trying to improve the lab or that they've already got a problem in that lab? Yeah, I think the answer is both. Uh, certainly even early on in 2019, all those patents and, and their comments that they're, and the visitors that they're getting, people coming in and teaching classes on better uh, biocontainment practices as, as well, uh, certainly looks like there was some type of a sentinel moment when all of a sudden they're, they're barricading the, the Wuhan Institute of Virology and all, the, all of a sudden the Chinese Communist Party leaders are involved coming and visiting uh, the laboratory as well. Wouldn't you see if the, if the virus was moving around in, in Wuhan, months earlier. Wouldn't there be evidence? To start with, it seems like it was just a very small leak, maybe just one or two, three pe or people infected. Maybe it was just people within the laboratory itself. Uh, certainly there's evidence that Wuhan lab workers were, were ill as well. So if, for some reason, it never got out in the community would be the theory. One of the things epidemiologists say is that the vast majority of the early cases are around that wet market. Right. If there was a leak weeks, months earlier, wouldn't those people have taken it home to a different neighborhood? Wouldn't it be elsewhere in the city or beyond? Right. So I think the Wuhan seafood market was a super spreader event. Even the Chinese government says this. Dr. Xi, the bat lady, says it was a super spreader event. The Chinese CDC says this was a super spreader event, that COVID did not originate there. Uh, if that virus came from there, from an animal, it should have been in lots of locations. The epidemiology of the seafood market would suggest that this virus was spread around the toilets, it was spread around people where they were eating lunch together, that type of thing. But once again, China shows us data, they take it away, they show it to us again. 
in. Uh, they won't give us the environmental data from going into and out of the seafood market as well. Uh, so that data is incomplete. But I think most scientists, they look at what happened there, they would conclude that this is a super spreader event. Not the actual origin point. No, no, sir. One of the things that people who say that had a natural origin, you can see in the earliest samples from the wet market that it has two lineages, that it splits early on. And that wouldn't have been cooked up in a lab. That's something that happens in the natural processes. Certainly there could have been one or two introductions uh, of, of, the, of the virus into the, to the market. Maybe it was two different people. So when a virus is passed from the bat to an animal, uh, and then tries to leap towards humans, there should be a lot of false tries. It can't get the perfect uh, glue to stick to the human lung cells. But this, this one showed up just perfect. So I think most of the evidence points towards that this was uh, made in a laboratory virus. So it, it's just too fitted to humans too soon. Too you perfect. Just, you, too perfect. So each human lung cell has a receptor, and think of it like a lock on a door. This virus just shows up de novo, out of nowhere, novel, with the perfect key to that lock. So you don't think this was some kind of bioweapon the Chinese military is working on? I do not. Here's the caveat. This report shows that the Chinese, the CCP, was very concerned about bioweapons. And therefore, they were developing a response to bioweapons as well, both countermeasures as well as offensive weapons. So I do think that there was scientists working for the PLA that were interacting with labs in Wuhan that certainly could have been doing that type of research. But I don't think that's what the purpose of SARS-CoV-2 was. What could the Chinese government do to clear this up? Um, be forthright and show us all the research. Uh, there, there's some witnesses I'm sure we'd like to, to talk to as well. And that leads us to what type of response should Congress have? What type of guardrail should we be putting around this gain of function research? And that last point that Senator Marshall is making it really is one that everyone agrees on in this debate, that China could dispel the suspicion, clear up the mysteries, if indeed it, it showed with the databases, with the, the blood bank evidence, exactly what was going on at that lab and the viruses that that lab housed. But they won't. Mona? And Terry, you mentioned in your report that this is a Republican-led report, but why aren't Senate Democrats signing on to this report? Do they dispute these findings? Uh, they don't, uh, but this was a report that was begun before the midterm elections when uh, the, there were Republicans who got together and they wanted to push this a as a minority report. The Democrats have, have supported this. Uh, yeah, not, they aren't signing on to it, but they've, they've, they've let their colleagues, it's a rare sign of cooperation. They may disagree with it. They aren't signing on to the conclusions. Uh, but it, it is an example of a very thoroughgoing uh, review of the evidence, both scientific and circumstantial as well. And they uh, are allowed, under the rules, the minority, to put, to get, to put out the report. But you don't hear anything from uh, the chairman, uh, Bernie Sanders, of this committee saying, well, this is, this is just an attack by Republicans or we don't agree with this. They're, they're letting the work that their colleagues did see the light of day, they can't stop it, and they aren't objecting to it. And that work does leave the door open for the theory that this was a natural spillover from animal to human. What does the evidence say regarding that? It, it does, and, and it takes a look at both possibilities. Let's take a look quickly, the evidence for a zoonotic origin, right? That's, that, that's a disease that can jump from animals to humans. And you see some of it there. That's a historical precedent. Uh, precedent. Almost all diseases come that way. It's, it's similar to viruses that are found in nature. The question is, how did it get, how did it get to be one that could infect humans? Uh, susceptible animals were nearby in that wet market. Uh, there were bad safety conditions at the wet market. Uh, raccoon dogs, there's been a finding of a raccoon dog DNA with coronavirus DNA and uh, also human DNA. It could have been a human with coronavirus uh, putting a hand on a table where a, a raccoon dog was, but there's a lot of of circumstantial evidence and the bio, the microbiology uh, biology evidence as well, virologists will tell you. So now against the zoonotic uh, theory, 
uh, there's, they haven't identified a host animal. There's no, uh, at this point, antibody evidence in the blood banks, but that's data that people really want to see. Was it circulating in Wuhan before it was declared? Uh, there are cases associated with the market, as, as you heard Senator Marshall say, not the first. Uh, where it is, it's just down the road from a virology lab that's studying coronaviruses, just like this one. Uh, and uh, you also see there's lack of uh, documented evidence infection in wet market. You, you don't see that. President's, uh, presence of a foreign cleavage site. That, that, that's that what Senator March was talking about. It's a perfect fit for the human body. Uh, and there's no evidence at this point of... Uh, coronaviruses that are progressing towards that perfection. Usually as viruses cook in animals and they're trying to find different hosts, you'll see early precursors can't infect humans, but they'd look like it. You might find something like that in the blood banks in Wuhan, as people gave blood in the weeks and months before, but that evidence isn't available. Mm, very interesting. But I do want to talk a little bit about the origins uh, of the outbreak because China's official position is that the outbreak began in December of 2019. But data shows that it likely started closer to October. How significant is that? Well, that's huge, isn't it? China just isn't coming clean. There's no doubt about that. And at this point, I believe their official position is still that it came in on frozen food lobsters, I believe, that it didn't begin in China at all. Nobody buys that, even though it, for a brief time, the World Health Organization signed on to it. Uh, but there's, there's no question that the first documented case, as China itself revealed and then took down that evidence, is November 17th of 2019, that's several weeks before December. And if you time out things like when peak cases are reached in Wuhan and where that's happened in cities around the world, it takes about 13 weeks. That puts you late October, early November uh, in Wuhan for the outbreak of this virus. And those weeks are critical. What was China doing? What did Chinese officials know? We know that as soon as people did start talking about of a virus loose in Wuhan, Chinese authorities came down hard on them. Remember uh, Dr. Wen Liang, the, the great brave doctor who was warning his colleagues in a hospital that there was an unusual uh, virus that was sickening healthcare workers, uh, and they forced him to apologize for that. He later died of COVID. They've now made him a hero. But China's record is so bad, especially in those early weeks, that it does open the door for an investigation. Investigators believe they've found other circumstantial evidence that suggests that the virus is not only much earlier, but could well be associated with that lab. There's still so much to learn. As you mentioned, China can be more forthcoming and clear this all up, but they won't. Uh, Senior National Correspondent Terry Moran, thank you. Sure. And I want to bring in ABC News contributor and epidemiologist John Brownstein, along with ABC's Jay O'Brien on Capitol Hill for more. John, I'm going to start with you. The report points to the presence of a human fern cleavage site in COVID's genetic sequence as a potential smoking gun, which shows that the virus was manipulated. Can you put that into layman's terms and uh, what do you make of that? Yeah, well, Mona, we have to remember this document is not a scientific study, and there's plenty of uncertainty. All of this does is collate the amount of evidence that we've been collecting over the past several years. We've been talking about this current cleavage site for months. It's essentially a sequence of amino acids that's found on the spike protein of COVID, which allows it to enter the cell more easily. And many researchers have said that this sequence is unusual and as a result of a lack of manipulation, but that's a very minor group that is saying that most scientists actually believe that this was not deliberate or manipulated in a lab, that this has actually evolved naturally. We actually see the pure cleavage site in other pathogens, avian flu, HIV, Ebola, and even another coronavirus, MERS, and they are known to increase infectivity. So while I know it's, it's a, a, something that people have pointed to, it's definitely not a smoking gun and still really a matter of scientific debate and really circumstantial evidence at this point. Mm. And I want to take it to Capitol Hill. Jay, we talked to Terry and he's saying that Senate uh, Democrats are largely quiet about this, but how are lawmakers reacting to this report? 
Well, I can tell you there's not just interest in the idea of this report. There's interest in this issue writ large on Capitol Hill, particularly amongst Republicans, but there are some Democrats engaged in this topic as well. The ideas of where did COVID come from, and a lot of Republicans pointing the figure, obviously, at China and that lab leak theory. This idea on Capitol Hill of digging in to the origins of COVID and pointing the finger at China is not new. There was a report as far back as August 2021 from the House Foreign Affairs Committee Committee that came to a similar conclusion, although it wasn't as detailed as this Senate Help Committee minority report that Terry was just talking about. But again, a lot of interest on Capitol Hill into looking at this issue in the coming weeks and months. Case in point, this is a Senate report that we're talking about today, but in the House, there is a subcommittee hearing into the origins of COVID talking about the idea of the lab leak theory. They're going to hear from former Trump Director of National Intelligence, John Ratcliffe, who is going to tell them from his understanding of, in, of the current available intelligence that he believes that the lab leak theory is the most prominent and possible theory, the most likely theory. But again, detractors saying that the evidence is thin and that it's circumstantial. Mona. Jay said there's a lot of interest in the report, but the report does not include classified intelligence that could shed more light on the pandemic's origins. When do you think that would be made public and what can we expect? Well, think back to a few months ago. There was a law passed first in the Senate, and then it gets passed with strong bipartisan support in the House to declassify any remaining classified U.S. intelligence into the origins of COVID. That gets sent to the president, and President Biden backs it, and he signs it into law, and it gets enacted around March 20th. Now, the text of the law says you have 90 days, the federal government has 90 days to declassify the relevant COVID intelligence. So 90 days from March 20th would be mid June. June. So the clock is ticking for the U.S. government to declassify certain things, what they declassified, what they opt to perhaps hold on to, because they can remain, they can make an argument that something should remain classified. That is still unclear, but we're looking to get a lot more information potentially from the federal government about their point of view on the origins of COVID in the coming months, Mona. All right. And, and John, I want to ask you a question uh, about the lab, because the report says that researchers in Wuhan had some 20,000 animal virus samples and were working in subpar biosafety environments. Is that unusual at all? And what kind of safety measures should have been in place? Well, Mona, this is concerning, if true. You know, researchers work with animal virus samples around the world. Having this number of samples is not unusual. But if they are in subpar conditions, that is a concern. We need to exercise extreme care, proper containment. We have these specific guidelines called biosafety level, BSL, and we need very proper protective equipment, to, this research to be done in decontaminated areas, ventilation systems, pressure suits. There's a whole range of, of modalities that need to be put into place in order to protect people handling these samples as well as the community. So this report suggests that these samples were not being held in these kind of standards. So yes, that is a concern if true. And this report actually cites some of your own work. What's your take? Just give it to us straight. Do you think that there is enough evidence at this point to convince you that this lab, this leak came from a lab? Well, Momona, we did research on this on this very topic three years ago, where we showed that the hospitals were filling up in the fall of 2019. But largely, that is still circumstantial. So even though our own research pointed to a potential concern of emergence early in Wuhan, we still just don't know. We need data to be unlocked to fully appreciate what happened. There has been incredibly detailed work at the market, as, as Terry suggested, showing the samples being collected there. So that's still very likely a potential hypothesis. So really, both theories still remain in play. All right, John Brownstein and Jay O'Brien, thank you so much both for joining us.